So here's a beautiful story. This is a picture of what seedlings look like when they're fed different um, amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And I, I don't know, just the amount of information conveyed by a picture can be pretty strong. I really enjoy looking at that kind of thing. This one is not so nature-based, it's more data-based. Um, I believe this is a map, this one on the cover, is a map of connections and links of the Paris Metro or something like that. Oh, very clever. Um. <laughs> Here's one of my favorite books about plant propagation. I'm very into plant propagation. Um, and this is a really beautiful little nature story about how ferns reproduce. They have a very interesting life cycle. So often when people think of nature stories, they think of life cycles, like how a tadpole turns into a frog and that kind of thing. Well, this is how, how ferns run their life cycle. Um, and I really enjoy this kind of thing. Um, most nature books have some sort of nature story in them. Atlases are a good place to look for them as well. Um, but this nature story I found today is one that I got out of my own garden. Um, and I, because we can't really take the camera outside and expect the sound and the light and everything to work out well without a professional videographer, which I do not have up my sleeve, um, he's actually in the back room on a work meeting. Um, <laughs> I took some, I found some pictures on the internet of the very thing I wanted to illustrate or show you guys that I had observed that I just love that happens out in my garden. Um, so I have these really beautiful flowers. They're called uh, salvia hot lips. Um, and they've already wilted a little bit. But here they are. Let me put them on a white piece of paper. And I have noticed over the years of watching these things grow and just flower and bloom that they have some interesting aspects to them. Um, you guys still with me on this? I'm, I'm just chatting. Uh, so they have these really neat little flowers that are designed to have a pollinator put their bill or their proboscis in. And they're right here. You're supposed to get a little bit of pollen delivered to this um, uh, pistil right here, which would fertilize the fruit and make seeds. Right there. Um, and that's how it's supposed to work. However, when I watch bumblebees at this flower, so you're supposed to get this effect, right? This is the same flower, I found it on the internet. And this is the same bird that I watch every day visit these flowers. But I also see this scenario. This is a different flower, but this is the same bumblebee. He comes and he sips off the side of the flower. So he's cheating, he's taking the nectar, but he's not delivering the pollen. Which I think is a very kind of neat story. And I thought it would make a very neat story to illustrate. So the way I would start doing this is I've already done some of the work, right? I've watched this happen in my garden and I thought it was cool. So I did a little bit of research. I discovered what kind of flower it is. Hot lip salvia. You can probably look up the actual name. Um, and I also discovered what species I was observing. Anna's hummingbird and this bumblebee is very common in our gardens. I also have to look up its name, its scientific name, I mean. And then I get to draw a nice little picture that illustrates both of these things happening, which this kind of thing is so fun. Um, and I think because I am drawing for you and not for me, as usual, I'm gonna start just by kind of crashing into the drawing and drawing as, as kind of as dark as I can right off the bat just so that we can get a good start. I'm gonna turn it this way. Um, and think of this as a draft sketch, but it's done in final pen. Ordinarily, I would carefully sketch it and then recopy it or trace it or something. So I start and the scenario I want is to illustrate the two species doing something that would never happen in real life, which is visit the flower at the same time. Something that would be probably more real would be to do two flower stalks. Um, but I also don't want to do that because it will take longer. Um, so there's one flower here. And then, so you realize that I'm skipping a lot of my own steps that I've taught you. I'm skipping all the accuracy steps I taught last week and the week before, um, and some other stuff negative space, uh, planning, proportion, all that stuff I just skipped. 
Um, something that's really important to my story is the shape of this little pistol right here. And then right underneath it, also important to my story, are these two little anthers. So again, with the misspent youth, I had a lot of time in my life where I spent a lot of time thinking about the names of flowers and drawing their pictures. Um, I took seed plant biology in college and I loved it. My favorite class ever. Um, so there's a little anatomy sketch of one. And then I think I'm going to do one right here. I don't know, watching other people draw, maybe a little bit boring. But we're about to get to the fun part. Because as soon as I have this flower down, see it goes up like that. I don't really like that. There's its little pistol. And there's its little flag. Essentially, this, this part right here, it's kind of a target for the pollinator that signals a pollinator from far away where to come. <clears throat> so there's one. And then we want to put another one over here, like this one. And I've noticed when I'm out watching these guys steal nectar that when they land on them, they push them down a little bit, like that. Can you see that? I'm drawing it a little bit bigger than real life so you guys can see it. So this idea of a nature story, there are many, many different kinds of nature stories. Many of them are like a little phenomenon like this one, where I see something interesting happening. It's, it's kind of an observation of the world. Um, many of them are like, time stories uh like one of my favorite nature stories is how the continents have shifted over time and that's very much a, a a long period of time but there's also short time like um the life cycle of a tadpole or a fern um, which is in some cases a month or two or a year um so here are my flowers so nature stories really require a lot of a lot of research so an observation. Usually when I'm making up a nature story, um, it starts right here with observation. So I wrote them wrong. One, two. And then essentially what you do is you put things together. Um, so I have the real thing right here. Uh, something that would have helped my project a lot is to go out and field sketch these animals right outside my window, right behind that curtain behind me, uh, interacting with the flowers. But I didn't really think of this story until this morning, so I didn't do that. So here's this guy, and this is going to sort of stand in for my field sketch. Um, he's out in the field, and he's landed on this flower, and he's clinging to it, and he's pushed it down a little bit. Um, so this is one of the tools you can use, is just to search up the internet and find what you're looking for. Um, something I can't really demonstrate because my phone is busy looking at my desk and recording it, um, is that if you take a picture of something, both in, on an Apple phone and on a Google phone, uh, there's an option to, to tell the camera to go search the internet for matching pictures. On Google, it's called Google Lens. And I now actually use that a lot. Um, so I could take a picture of this flower with Google Lens and tell Google Lens, tell me what this flower is. And it's very likely that it would tell me the right flower, which I think is remarkable. However, I did have it take a picture of my adorable little mud dauber wasp, and it had no idea at all. Even from several different angles, it couldn't do it. Um, I don't even remember what it thought it was, some kind of rock. Um, so sometimes you get a logical answer, and sometimes you get a no logical answer. Um, so using it does require some knowledge of the world, like is this the right thing or not. Um, Often what I'll do is take a picture with Google Lens and then I'll go read all my plant books or insect books to see whether Google Lens was right or not. So what happens when this little bee lands here? Um, and I'm gonna freehand draw it and I'm gonna try and draw it uh, in real life. So who knows whether this is gonna be right or not. The bee lands here and he steals from the flower. He's not 
the flower is in good faith providing um, the flower is providing the the nectar in exchange for pollination services but the bee is taking the the pollen without without providing the services so this is sort of a neat little thing that's happening here it's not um it's not sort of evolutionarily what you would expect um, but because the flower gets the pollination services from elsewhere it doesn't really matter now i think that i would have to draw that for a while before i got it right again with the rough drafting here so he's sipping out of the flower and he has these awesome big eyes okay so there's our bee stealing now in order to make this in perspective right so my bee might be a little bit large my flowers are see i have a scale right here my flowers this is something that you often do in real life my flowers are about an inch long so one inch equals one flower when you are nature drawing you really ought to do this it's pretty important to do it um, and to keep things in in scale so my b is too big my next version of this drawing would probably make the b a little bit smaller i don't know how too much too big it is but maybe a little bit big uh, where else is he black black here and his head is black it's already looking better and he has another set of legs somewhere which i should really show all right any comments so far you guys can chat in if you wish so there's one half um something that you should do when you are um uh making an actual science illustration with a science story is um label them with their scientific names label them with a scale and then um something that scientists like to do is put a date and a time for posterity essentially i don't even know what the date is um and then my hummingbird i've drawn hummingbirds a lot in my life um and this one is actually visiting the flower we're talking about and you can see right here the anthers from the flower are delivering the pollen to the top of the beak of the hummingbird and you can actually see the pollen on the hummingbird's beak yeah I'll hold it up making it a little bit orange that means every time he goes to another flower he or she goes to another flower she's actually doing the pollination service that the flower is trading the nectar nectar for so not cheating um so because the hummingbird is bigger we're gonna go let's make these bigger so that you can really see what's happening here here's the hummy's beak and again with the whole like spontaneous drawing never really works out the way you want it to i like the little hummingbird's little eye thing um I'm gonna say that the hummingbird's wings come in here somewhere. I'm kind of doing the in flap right now. Something like that. This is kind of a very different lesson than the previous weeks, which were more like how to draw. This one is more like, what are we doing here? Who's this for? What's neat about this is the hummingbird is delivering the pollen and the honey bee 
is stealing the pollen. So it kind of makes a neat little story. And I think you would make a little caption here. It's kind of like a bumblebee steals an actor humming bird pollinates flower in exchange for nectar. And I happen to know off the top of my head this is an Anna's hummingbird. Because that's who I see out there and that's who I printed. And that its scientific name is Calypteon. When you're scient writing scientific names, you underline them unless you can write italics. The first word is a genus and the second word is a species. The first word is capitalized and the second word is not. Now, I didn't look up the name for this guy, so I have to do that afterwards, and I'll post it to Google Classroom. Um, but I think that is probably, other than putting color on it and making it cooler, probably what I would present for this little nature story. Um, there's a little tiny nature story hidden inside this nature story, which is pretty cool. And that's that when these flowers become pollinated, they turn completely red as a signal that you no longer need to visit them. So the white and red ones like this have not been pollinated yet. And the red ones like this have been. Um, so the plant is actually trying to maximize who's visiting when. It's kind of clever. A lot of plants have little signals like that that they do. Any questions? <laughs> um, oh, hi, Lisa. <laughs> okay. Um, something that you can also do is I just pulled a bunch of colors and things. Um, they're not really in sight. Let me put them in sight. So something that I've noticed, I posted a person I really like on the Google Classroom, Felix Scheinberg. Um, he is a German illustrator. He likes to paint in like the nightclubs of Berlin. Sketch. He's like an urban sketcher. Um, but he often only adds a few colors to each drawing he makes. And I really like that style. Um, where you don't actually have to say much. You just can say enough. I think it's a really clever way to draw. Um, so maybe that's enough. You know, that says bumblebee here, hot lip sage. Anna's hummingbird. We're done. Good enough. Good enough for government work, as my grandfather would say. Uh, something that might help to tell the story a little bit is if I made the hummingbird's beak brownish, just to differentiate it and make it more clear what's going on here. Maybe pick the brown up into his eye, but. Sadly, the brown is not working very well. Um, another thing that might help is to show the pollen right here because it's such an important part of the story. And to show the pollen here and maybe here. Um, and you can actually annotate your drawings a little bit and say something like anthers deliver pollen. B never touches the anthers. Beak and anthers meet. So there's one little story that you can observe in your own garden. I thought it was really neat. Um, something that I have done in the past as a naturalist is just sit next to one plant and see who came for the day. Um, or one thing I did is sit in a meadow with wildflowers one, one spring day 
and I mapped out the wildflowers and then I um, noted all day long um, who visited for the day. And I made a few collections and then I also did a study um, in college where I captured pollinators and I uh, took samples off their proboscis or off their body to see what pollen they were carrying. And that was very fun. And you can do that without actually injuring them. You do it with scotch tape and a gentle hand. And then you can look at the pollen through microscope. And I got to tell you that pollen is one of the most beautiful things to look at ever, um, which is kind of neat. So there's one story. Does anyone have any comments, questions? hopes, dreams, or visions. Let's see. Look, well, glad you guys are enjoying this. Yeah. This is actually shaping up to be a nice little drawing. Um, and it's sort of a sketchbook page. It's not what I would call a finished work for by any means it's not what i would put in a magazine or present as an illustration um but it, i will definitely glue it into my sketchbook because it's kind of cute <laughs> i like it um one of the nice things about sketching is you just sort of keep on working at it um notice how the little tiny bits of color say a lot about um they just say they differentiate the painting from itself a little bit um so notice that it's becoming more and more clear the parts of the flower are becoming more clear as i just color in the leaves as i color in the red and parts it then becomes clear what's flower what's anther what's daemon something you could do is look at the little stigmas again and see what color they really are so i notice let me bring them up close and try to hold them still can they come into focus? I don't think I can do that. Let's see. See how they're pink? Wow, that's going to help a lot. Let me find a pink pen. So this is going to help. This little front bit of each flower is a little bit pink. This one's kind of squished up under him. There you go. Um, let's see, what else could we do for this guy? As soon as you know about this sort of pollen robbing, you'll notice it a lot as you watch flowers. It happens a fair amount. Um, it, it, I see it around a lot. Um, so you guys can put into the, into the chat uh nature stories that you might think you might want to illustrate um let me see if we can just brainstorm a few um let's see <laughs> let's see um let's see you know just life cycles are always easy and fun to look at something that's happening in my front yard right now is I just planted a bunch of apple trees, or just new fruit trees, one of them's an apple. So I planted pink lady apples, and it's their first year. Um, so there's something interesting happening out there. One thing that I love doing, and one thing that was sort of the, the um, example for this class was just a picture of things I found on a beach. So just like collections. So you go to one place, and you draw what you see like a little represented sample, like a portrait in bits, uh, is a really fun nature story to do. Portrait in pieces. Um, one thing that I love to do is a map. Um, and these can be sort of mind maps. I love doing these, um, especially like these can be like things you see on your favorite wall. Um, one story could be, um, what's in your favorite garden in the neighborhood? What makes it special? Um, let's see. Let me tell you a little bit about the pink apples. They're kind of cool. 
apple. So they planted this apple tree. Um, and they, they have little um, flowers like this. It's kind of the side view of the flower. And then out of each little, what do you mean, peduncle, I suppose you'd call that. There are several of those, like this. But then there's one on the, the whole tree. There's only one. It's only happened in one. We have this. My little daughter is thrilled because this is a baby apple. The others tend to just dehiss, like the flowers wither and die, and they just fall off without ever forming a little apple. So I'm wondering if my garden needs more bees. lots more bees. So something, one fun nature story would be to think about, you know, why did this happen and this happen? What are the two conditions where that happened? Um, maybe this is just what you expect from a first year fruit tree where you get one or two fruits um, and it just proves it's fertile and the next year you get a real crop. I don't know, because I'm not good at fruit trees. This is my first try. Um, let's see. <laughs> so, do we have any other suggestions for that? Um, I have a couple samples in my sketchbook. This one, I have to confess, the sketchbook is really, really old. I really love it. Um, it's not it. Maybe I don't have it. Nope, I don't think I have it right here. Um, I am some... interrupting while you look for that. I yeah. saw someone is uh, photographing oak galls. And oh, is that's going a to wonderful one. Now. Yes, do you want to talk about oak galls? Because they're so <laughs> cool. I think that she, whoever it is should, because I don't actually know much about them. Um, but galls come in, like they come in many different shapes and forms. Um, the ones that we call oak apples, they kind of look like this. When you find them on the ground, they have a hole in them, like that. Um, and that means what has actually happened here is that a wasp laid an egg in the bark. So something that looks about like that. And then the bark essentially had an autoimmune response and created this little casing. And then in here grew a little grub inside there. And then when the grub was finally mature, it crawled its way out. Um, but oak galls are amazing. Um, sometimes galls are formed like this on like leaves. You can see them this shape too. The whole science to galls, I just love them. They're really great. Um, so there was another sort of story I was going to illustrate from my backyard. Just I don't know if I can do this off the top of my head, but it's one of my favorite stories, and it happens every year. Um, so let me just give this a good try. Let me get a different pen. So every year, uh, in the fall and the summer, there's a warm rain. You guys probably know where this is going. And I have a stump in my backyard. Looks about like this. It has a hollow in the middle. Like that. So it's really dark and shady in here. And then the rain falls. A little bit of rain and puddles a little bit and it's warm the sun is shining and all of a sudden the air is filled with bees this is one day a year that i call termite day and this is this is actually a really neat story and 
you think, oh, the termites eat my house. But termite day is actually a bonanza for almost everybody who's not a human. Because <laughs> these little winged animals emerge in the bazillions and fly all over the place. They're looking for a new place to nest. So this is a big part of their reproductive cycle. And these little winged ones are called the alates. They're the winged version of termites. Most termites don't have wings. They're deep here chewing on the wood. So most termites live in here and they just chew all the time. And then the alates fly out. They just crawl out by the bazillions. And what happens on um, termite day is that every bird in the world becomes fat and happy. This is my black BB. And they just sit and eat and eat and eat. Um, and one thing that's really lovely to do on termite day is to go for a walk in the woods. Because this is literally happening everywhere. Everybody is eating these little things that are flying everywhere. And so I always thought that a really wonderful little um, illustration for like Bay Nature or something be a celebration of termite day because i often think people think termites are just terrible but i think that they are very important for bird migration and other things like that um, because i think that they serve a really important ecological function in that they provide a whole bunch of food at a very important little moment in everybody's life um, and i have also seen around this little stump in my backyard so notice right now, I'm sort of riffing, right? I'm not referencing anything. I'm just thinking about um, this day that happens every year. Um, I'm not, I know this is a black Phoebe, but it's not drawn right. And I can also just label it to help people. I could even spell it right to help people. Um, but I'm not really, notice that it's not super important to get it all the details exactly right, and I'm not really all that interested. Um, it's far more important to just sort of get on with drawing than it is to make your drawing perfect. Um, something I often see is the alates sort of are shaped like this. Also notice that my um, when they're perched, they kind of keep their wings back like that. Uh, notice that um, my scale is way off because he's perched here, but these are much bigger, so. I'm kind of, what I could do is say, draw little things and say 10x, <laughs> so that you can tell. Um, but let's see here, what can I think about, say about these? I just think it would be a really lovely thing. So the, what you need is rain, sun, spring, or fall. And it has to be warm happens every year and usually I walk out my door and the, the sky is shimmering literally shimmering and then I go for a big long hike because it's a really fun day to be outside so if you wanted to develop this idea I've also seen around my very same stump this really giant alligator lizard and he gets fat and happy on this day too so then one of the things I would do to do this drawing is go find a picture of an alligator lizard or go find the gentleman himself. I'll have a big smile on his face if it's, if it's termite day um, and draw his picture and add him into the picture. The other thing that lives in the inside of this stump, um, I usually have a little spotted salamander in there that I can put him into because he's also happy on termite day. Um, Essentially, on termite day, everybody eats. Let's see. I don't know if you guys have studied a lot of design thinking, but often when I'm drawing, I think about design thinking a lot. And I think about kind of that idea of rapid iteration and just getting on with it and trying something rather than trying to make something perfect 
I'll we'll just kick my leg. Um, because this is actually a pretty good idea, and I would probably get my act together and um, go outside and think about what it really looks like and draw a picture of it in real life. Um, go out on termite day and see what birds love the termites the best. Um, and I have actually seen a alligator lizard sitting on top of a of a um, termite mound with its mouth stuffed full of termites. It just couldn't eat anymore. Um, <laughs> Which I thought was really cute. Let's see. So if we wanted to clean this up, um, and put in a few more birds, the other thing that happens is because all the birds are sort of drunk on termites, you then have like the sharp shinned and the Cooper's hawk coming in and and harvesting the birds because the birds are so busy eating. And usually this happens right at um, right when it's time to migrate. So everybody's fattening up their big long flies. Um, I don't think a hummingbird would be there, but certainly the, the little dark eyed juncos would be happy to eat all this stuff. You think, oh, but they're seed eaters, but they eat anything available, they'd be very happy to eat it too. Um, I see uh, I see the um, acorn woodpeckers hunting them as well. So there's a story, that would be a fun one. Um, I also, <laughs> anybody have comments on that? So usually if you're illustrating, um, giving science illustrations, I can't emphasize enough how just going outdoors, um, there's sort of a difference between going outdoors with intent to capture something and going outdoors with sort of an open mind. And I always find it very useful to just go outside and sit. Um, there is always something going on outdoors. Um, but if you go outdoors and sort of demand that nature give you something, you'll probably be too impatient to notice what it's giving you. Um, so just go and sit and be still. And something I've noticed that uh, is that many people think the natural world is empty, but what's happening is they're moving through it and they're causing the emptiness as they move. So if you go and sit still, the world resumes around you after about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so just give it a few minutes. Sit down somewhere by a creek or a Usually water is best. Just go sit down by a pond and the world will very slowly and gently resume around you and you'll be like, wow, look at all these people who live here that I had never noticed before. Um, it's a little weird to teach into a void, <laughs> I gotta say. Um, so let's see. Uh, I was thinking about um, another one that I had thought of recently and now I can't think of it. There was just a really wonderful uh, little video online um, and it revealed a story that most of us had never thought of before and that's that um, badgers and coyotes hunt together and it was such a cute little video so um, I was thinking that could be a really fun one. <laughs> I just thought it was neat. There's one nature story that happens in my garden every morning. I'm going to draw it for you. At the bottom of my driveway, this is a little grate. Like this. And under the grate, there's a little bit of water. And one really wonderful nature story. It's an old drain from the house. So under the ground, there's a rain drain and it just is clogged and there's always a little bit of water in it. Um, one of the really great nature stories I was thinking of is to like do a zoom in as to who lives in the water, which I'm sorry to say is usually little um, mosquito grubs, shaped like that. Um, 
I usually put a dunk in them. But also any other, like, do we have amoebas? You know, anybody else who lives in there, little water mites. I see little water mites in there. Um, but I also have things like, uh, I have a crow that comes every single day and drinks from it. And the Phoebe gets drinks from it. Um, so one thing that would be neat would be to catalog all the birds that come to it. Um, pretty much every dog comes to it and drinks. Um, the cats drink out of it. The crows drink out of it. And late at night, a raccoon comes every night and lifts the crate out, moves it aside, and washes his dinner in it. So <laughs> I was thinking that would be another good one. Um, but I also have a microscope in my kit. So what would be neat is just to do a general survey of everybody who interacts with this little puddle of water. Um, also, children invariably come and stick their fingers in it. Um, <laughs> So that's another fun nature story that happens in my life quite a lot. Um, so let me see, another piece of paper. I had some ideas for the next four weeks. Um, and you guys can vote them up or down um, or add other comments to them or whatever. I'll put them on the Google Classroom. Um, I thought I would do two weeks of color theory and this one is a little tough, because, simply because I'm trying to keep this class open to absolutely everyone. Well, I do think that The Drain would be a good children's book. <laughs> um, uh, so I was thinking of two color theory weeks, but I'm concerned, I'm trying to keep this, this class open to everyone, and I'm concerned that people don't have color supplies. Um, but I thought I would just run by you. Um, I'll design something where we can do the color with just colored pencils like that. Um, it will be hard to do color theory with markers um, because you need to mix and markers don't mix very well. Um, one of my favorite, whoa, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, I put something on the cord. It's still there. One of my favorite um, art supply tools is um, water soluble colored pencils. Um, let me just show you here. Many of you have seen these before. These happen to be Derwent ink tents, um, and they do that, which is super fun. So when you buy these, you sort of get two art supplies in one. You get watercolors and colored pencils. Um, so I really love them. Um, uh, Rembrandt makes a good set. Derwent makes a good scent. Uh, Faber-Castell makes a good scent. I will post a list of good sets on, on um, the Google Classroom. I need to make a list of things that I've said I would do. Um, uh, H2O pencils. Because otherwise I won't remember. Um, the other thing that you could bring for color mixing is just like a kid's watercolor kit. So you can learn color mixing with that. Um, it'll be just fine. You probably won't use the white. Um, and essentially we would use three primaries for the exercises I have in mind. All right. Um, I, I also have like squeeze tubes like this. Um, you can use these. I tend to squeeze them out and let them dry in a palette. Um, you could also squeeze them out and let them dry on a plate if you don't have a palette. I haven't done that here. I tend to use my plate as mixing space because this one doesn't have very much mixing space. Um, so that would be sort of supplies for color theory. Um, again, colored pencils. I'll try and actually do it with colored pencils mainly so that, because I feel, feel like that's sort of a nice base material that everybody might have. You could also do it with crayons. Um, so two incidences of color theory. Um, and I don't know how geeky you guys like being. Um, <laughs> Let's see if there are any comments on that. Oh, I also like the draw flower as it develops because one of the things you see in nature stories um, is time and it's a great thing to, um, to capture in drawings. 
And if you notice, many, many stories are focusing on a moment in time, like the termite story, or they're capturing processes, like how many people visit my little water puddle, or they are um, capturing time, like how the continents move. Um. <laughs> so number three, I don't know if you guys are cool. I, you guys are telling me you're cool with geeky, but I can teach you a very simple perspective class. And in this class, we would also have time for ellipses. Um, you can say you're our name for that, but I feel like it's worthwhile spending time. This one would be sort of interesting in that it would actually be a draw along. We would all do it together. Whereas most of my classes are like, I imagine you guys are sort of drawing, but also sort of mostly listening, doodling, watching. So it's kind of cool. Um, and then I had another sort of fourth idea, which of course I meant to write this up ahead of time, but I didn't. Um, oh yeah, I thought it would be really fun to um, kind of talk about conceptual drawing and imaginative drawing. Just a little bit. And something I love about this is that it's very helpful for things like what we're doing today for like um, story, writing stories, because you notice I'm pulling all of my stories from different places. I'm pulling them from my memory, from the web, from Google Lens, from real life, when I draw my actual flowers, from field sketches, um, from field sketches I did 20 years ago. And so having skills in conceptual drawing and imaginative drawing is really, really key to being a good drafts person. And to me, this is such a wonderful revelation because I have spent so much of my life being an observational drawer and not even realizing that this whole field of inquiry existed. I've always been somebody who wanted to look at the real world and draw it. But I just took this design thinking class at Stanford and there was one lecture where a young man came in and he drew, uh, he has always drawn conceptually. And so I was like, wow, we're like from opposite sides of the art world or from just the drawing world. And it was really neat to have that sort of all become a big part of my life. Um, so I thought that was cool. Sorry, can't help it. Duck. Um, so yeah, any questions about any of that? Does anyone have feedback? So somebody's yes for conceptual drawing. You know what I think might happen with conceptual drawing is I would do it. <laughs> That's a very conceptual bird. You are right. Um, <laughs> conceptual, what, what might happen with conceptual drawing is seeing as it's week four, if you guys love it, I would just make uh, four more weeks of conceptual drawing because it's actually a really interesting way to think. Um, and I very much enjoyed this sort of trigger experience I had where I was like, wow, there's a whole part of drawing I'd never thought of before. Um, so that would be fun. The color theory will keep us busy for a while though. So maybe the next sequence will be mainly here. Um, and I'll think of some ideas. And then I think we'll do this and conceptual drawing. Uh, you know, as you become a good color theorist and a good conceptual drafts person, you then sort of develop sort of the key skills to make things up. Or to fill in the blanks from sketches you did in the field, but you didn't quite finish. Um, something that I love about nature sketchers um, is often you're busy in the field and you finish your drawings late at night. Um, so as your color theory develops, you can then do your sketching in the field, write a few notes about what colors things were, and then paint at night. Um, and I've done that a lot in, the, in my field work. Um, any other questions, comments? <laughs> um, something that's interesting is as I discovered this conceptual world, I started um, buying conceptual drawing books and reading them. And it really, really helped me jump forward in my conceptual skills. 
and really make me realize where where it was lacking. So uh, that was really kind of fun. Um, <laughs> it's it's neat to be forty and discover that there's a whole new world out there you hadn't noticed. Um, uh, I was going to show you. Did I have anything else to show you? Oh, this is something I put out here just to like put it out here. But um, as you are drawing and making your nature stories, you, sure you can use the online world, but I love going back to the classics and just opening my bird book. Something that conceptual drafts people do very well is they'll take, say, this picture of a northern rough-winged swallow and think, wow, I want this swallow in this pose. And they'll juxtapose these two. So they'll take this pose and they'll put those markings on that pose. And that's a very conceptual idea. Um, so that's something you can do with your nature books. Here's my cute little black baby. Um, I actually saw this guy once. It was pretty phenomenal. Uh, so just your basic nature books are great. Um, I do know that the libraries opened up their eBooks. Um, and then of course there's just the internet. Um, if you need library books or whatever, you can borrow mine. Or if you're searching for something, I can help you find it. Um, if you need identity help with, with plants and stuff, you can log into my Google Classroom, send me a picture, and I will do my best to help you. All right. Again, with the whole misspent youth. And we have a great question. Sorry, and what? And we have a great question. Risa. Yeah. What conceptual drawing books do you have or recommend? Oh, can you guys uh, sit still and I'll go get them? Or do you want me to list them on Google Classroom? It'll take me about 30 seconds to go grab them all. Okay, let me go get them for just a sec. Hang on. Okay, I did put them all someplace else than I thought. So I will make a list and put it on Google Classroom for you. Because I have a bunch that I really like. Uh, okay. Great. Yeah. I will just you make a list for you. Them. Yeah. I tried to find them, but I don't have them in the right place. Sorry. They're on a different bookshelf than I thought. All right, no any other questions? There was a question from Jeannie about if you take photographs um, yourself for reference when you get home. I told her I definitely do when I'm working in the field, but I'd like to know what you do. Um, I take photos and then I don't listen to them. Um, so I take a lot of photos in the field, but I find that um, live sketches and memories are better. Um, it kind of depends on what I'm trying to do. If I want accuracy for a scientific drawing, then I will look very closely at the photos. If I want integrity for artistic merit, say for a landscape painting or something like that, it works much, much better to work from sketches and memory um, and have sort of a more emotive respo response. I think you can actually see this in one of the drawings I made today. Let's see. Wow, when I'm moving fast, I put things down in the weirdest places. Um, my cute little drawing. Yeah, here. Um, so I think here, right? I did a little conceptual drawing right here. So first of all, I switched it inside my head, just right off the top of my head. Um, if you, if your drawing skills need a little bit of Boom, you could just switch it in a, in a um, photo program, just plop the picture. Um, and then I also see how I rotated it a bit. And I dropped his butt down because I felt like when I watch them outdoors, they wrap around this particular flower a bit more. So this drawing is literally, this drawing flipped plus all the observations I've made in the field. So it's actually a really good example of what I mean when I say all these things sort of mush together to make something better than all the parts. 
Um, really like this. Oh, it came out great. Wow. Oh, I did not expect that. All right. Any other questions? Still have people on the line. Um, so I will set up a plan looks for like the next four, and I'll set, I'll send it out to the Google. Looks like no. What? Fanny. I was just um, going to say, it looks like no more questions. A lot of thank yous, and thank you everyone for for joining us. Okay. Um, and this will be available probably tomorrow. Um, at paacf.org, you'll find the recording. Okay. And I will post a new set of classes for the next four weeks to that same website and to the Google Classroom as well. All right. Terrific. Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to do these. It's a very nice thing to do while sequestered at home. Great. Awesome. Okay. Take care, That's everybody. Perfect. I'm going to the meeting now and I hope uh, everyone's staying well and um, we'll make some time to get outside and and do some drawings and find some stories thanks Anne. this was fantastic terrific thank you bye everyone bye everybody